The Governance of China, Volume 2, by Xi Jinping, Audiobook, Part 24. China's Diplomacy as a Major Country China's diplomacy must befit its major country status. November 28, 2014 Main points of the speech at the Central Conference on Foreign Affairs. We must stand firmly for peace, development, cooperation, and win-win outcomes. Give overall consideration to domestic development and international situations. And adopt a holistic approach to development and security. We must focus on the overriding goal of peaceful development and national rejuvenation. We must devote ourselves to safeguarding China's sovereignty, security, and development interests. Foster an international environment that is friendly to our peaceful development and take advantage of this important period of strategic opportunity for China. These efforts will ensure the realization of the two centenary goals and the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. Since the 18th National Congress of the CPC held in 2012, the central leadership, bearing in mind both domestic development and the international situation, has maintained continuity and consistency of China's foreign policy strengthened overall planning, and taken bold initiatives, and notable results have been achieved in China's diplomatic work. In view of the new tasks for the new era, we have worked creatively and proactively to break new ground in China's diplomatic theories and practice, and enrich the strategic thinking of peaceful development. We have explained to the international community the global implication and impact of the Chinese dream. We have advocated a new model of international relations underpinned by mutually beneficial cooperation, proposed and implemented a policy of upholding the greater good and pursuing shared interests, and championed a new vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. Moreover, we have endeavored to build a new model of major country relations and proposed and practiced a policy of building relations with neighboring countries based on amity, good faith, mutual benefit, and inclusiveness, and a policy of building relations with Africa based on sincerity, affinity, good faith, and real results. These accomplishments would not have been possible without the dedication of comrades engaged in China's foreign affairs, especially those posted overseas. To have a good grasp of global developments and follow the underlying trend of the times is a constant and crucially important task that requires our abiding attention if China is to move forward. It is important to have a global perspective grasp the pulse of the times, make a sound, accurate, and thorough assessment of the changing international environment, and dissect complex phenomena to uncover the essence and, in particular, have a good understanding of long-term trends. Furthermore, we should be fully mindful of the complexity of the evolving international architecture, And we should also recognize that the growing trend towards a multipolar world will not change. We should be fully aware that the ongoing global economic adjustment will not be smooth sailing. We also need to recognize that economic globalization will not stop. We should be fully alert to the grave nature of international tensions and conflicts. We also need to recognize that peace and development, the underlying trend of our time, will remain unchanged. We should be keenly aware of the protracted nature of the contest over the international order. On the other hand, we need to recognize that reform of the international system 
will not change its course. We should fully recognize the uncertainties in China's neighboring environment, but we should also realize that the general trend of prosperity and stability in the Asia-Pacific region will not change. Today, the world is changing. It is a world in which new opportunities and new challenges keep emerging. A world in which the international system and international order are going through a profound adjustment, and a world in which the balance of international forces is shifting steadily in favor of peace and development. In observing the world, we should not allow our views to be blocked by anything intricate or transient. Instead, we should observe the world through the prism of historical laws. All factors considered, we can see that China is still in an important period of strategic opportunity in which much can be accomplished. Our biggest opportunity lies in China's steady development and the growth in its strength. On the other hand, we should be mindful of various risks and challenges and skillfully diffuse potential crises and turn them into opportunities. China has entered a crucial stage of achieving the great renewal of the Chinese nation. Profound changes are taking place in China's relations with the rest of the world, with closer interactions between China and the international community. As China has increased its dependence on the world and its involvement in international affairs, so has the world deepened its dependence on China and had a greater impact on China. Therefore, in projecting and adopting plans for reform and development, we must give full consideration to both domestic and international markets, both domestic and foreign resources, and both domestic and international rules, and use them judiciously. China must develop a distinctive diplomatic approach befitting its role as a major country. We should. Summing up our past practice and experience, enrich and develop our diplomatic theories and practice, and conduct diplomacy with salient Chinese features and a Chinese vision. We should uphold the CPC's leadership and Chinese socialism. We will stick to our development path, social system, cultural tradition, and values. We should continue to follow the independent foreign policy of peace, always pursue the development of the country and the nation by relying on ourselves, and follow our own path unswervingly. While pursuing peaceful development, we will never relinquish our legitimate rights and interests, or allow China's core interests to be impaired. We will promote democracy in international relations and uphold the five principles of peaceful coexistence. We are firm in our position that all countries, regardless of their size, strength, and level of development, are equal members of the international community, and that the destiny of the world should be decided by the people of all countries. We will uphold international justice and, in particular, speak up for developing countries. We should continue to pursue win-win cooperation, promote a new model of international relations based on such cooperation, follow the mutually beneficial strategy of opening up, and adopt the win-win approach to our external, external relations in the political, economic, security, cultural, and other fields. We must uphold the greater good and pursue shared interests. This means we should act in good faith, value friendship, champion moral principles, and uphold justice. We will never compromise the principle of non-interference in other countries' internal affairs. We will respect the choices of development path and social system made independently by people of other countries, promote peaceful resolution of differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation, and oppose the willful use of or threat of force. In conducting China's diplomacy in both the current stage and in the time to come, we should take a holistic approach to national security, 
strengthen the confidence of the Chinese people in the path, guiding theories and system of socialism with distinctive Chinese features, and ensure durable peace and stability in China. We should try to help other countries to understand and support the Chinese dream, which represents the Chinese people's aspiration for peace, development, cooperation, and win-win outcomes. What we pursue is the well-being of both the Chinese people and the people of all other countries. We should firmly uphold China's territorial sovereignty, maritime rights and interests, and national unity, and properly handle territorial and island disputes. We should protect China's development opportunities and space, and work hard to form a highly integrated, mutually beneficial network through extensive economic, trade, and technological cooperation. We should make more friends without prejudice to the non-aligned principle and build a global network of partnerships. We should enhance China's soft power and better present China to the world. We should promote neighborhood diplomacy and turn China and its neighboring countries into a community of shared future. In this regard, we should continue to implement the principles of amity, sincerity, mutual benefit, and inclusiveness in our relations with neighboring countries. Promote friendship and partnership with our neighbors. Foster an amicable, secure, and prosperous neighborhood environment and boost win-win cooperation and connectivity with our neighbors. We should manage our relations with other major countries well, build a sound and stable framework of major country relations, and expand cooperation with other major countries in the developing world. We should strengthen unity and cooperation with other developing countries and closely associate our development with the common development of other developing countries. We should actively engage in multilateral diplomacy and promote reform of the international system and global governance so that developing countries, China included, will have greater representation and bigger say. We should step up results-oriented cooperation, actively implement the Belt and Road Initiative, work hard to expand the converging interests of various parties, and promote win-win cooperation through results-oriented cooperation. In processing foreign aid, we should act in good faith, value friendship, and pursue shared interests. To protect China's overseas interests, we should continue to improve our capabilities for such protection. To fully advance China's diplomacy in the new era, we must enhance the centralized and unified leadership of the party, reform and improve foreign affairs-related institutions and mechanisms, step up intersector, interdepartment, and interregional coordination, increase strategic input, regulate foreign affairs management, and improve the training and management of diplomatic officers so as to provide a strong support for opening new horizons in China's diplomacy. Remember the past and our martyrs. Cherish peace and build a new future. September 3, 2015 Part of the speech at the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the victory of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese aggression and World War II. The Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese aggression and World War II were a decisive battle between justice and evil between light and darkness, and between progress and reaction. In that devastating war, the Chinese People's War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression started first and lasted longest. In defiance of aggression, the unyielding Chinese people fought gallantly and finally won total victory over the Japanese militarist aggressors thus preserving the achievements of China's 5,000-year-old civilization 
and defending the cause of peace for mankind. This remarkable feat on the part of the Chinese nation was rare in the annals of war. The victory of the Chinese people's war of resistance against Japanese aggression was the first complete victory won by China in its resistance against foreign aggression in modern times. This great triumph crushed the attempt of the Japanese militarists to colonize and enslave China, and it put an end to the national humiliation of China suffering repeated defeats at the hands of foreign aggressors. This great triumph reestablished China as a major country and won the Chinese people the respect of all peace-loving people around the world. This great triumph represented the rebirth of China, opened up bright prospects for the great renewal of the Chinese nation, and set our ancient country on a new journey. During the war, through enormous national sacrifice, the Chinese people held their ground in the main eastern theater of World War II, thus making a major contribution to overall victory. In their war against Japanese aggression, the Chinese people received extensive support from the international community. The Chinese people will always remember how the people of other countries contributed to victory in their war of resistance. The experience of war makes people value peace all the more. The aim of our commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the victory of the Chinese People's War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression and World War II is to bear history in mind, honor all those who laid down their lives, cherished peace, and build a new future. Ravaging through Asia, Europe, Africa, and Oceania, that war inflicted over 100 million military and civilian casualties. China suffered over 35 million casualties, and the Soviet Union lost more than 27 million lives. The best way to honor those heroes who gave their lives to the cause of freedom, justice, and peace, and to mourn the loss of innocent lives brutally taken during the war, is to make sure that this historical tragedy will never repeat itself. War is like a mirror. Looking into it helps us better appreciate the value of peace. Today, peace and development have become the prevailing trend, but the world is far from tranquil. War is the sword of Damocles that still hangs over mankind. We must learn the lessons of history and dedicate ourselves to peace. In the interest of peace, we need to foster a keen sense of a global community of shared future. Prejudice, discrimination, hatred, and war can only cause disaster and suffering, while mutual respect, equality, peaceful development, and common prosperity represent the right path to take. All countries should jointly uphold the international order and system underpinned by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, build a new model of international relations based on mutually beneficial cooperation, and advance the noble cause of global peace and development. In the interest of peace, China will remain committed to peaceful development. We Chinese always love peace. No matter how much stronger it might become, China will never seek hegemony or expansion. It will never inflict its past suffering on any other nation. The Chinese people are resolved to pursue friendly relations with all other peoples, defend the gains of the Chinese people's war of resistance against Japanese aggression and World War II, and make a greater contribution to mankind. The People's Liberation Army of China is the People's Army. All its officers and men must bear in mind their responsibility of serving the people wholeheartedly. They must faithfully fulfill the sacred duty of protecting the nation's security and people's well-being, 
and carry out the noble mission of upholding world peace. Here, I announce that China will cut the number of its troops by 300,000. As an ancient Chinese saying goes, after making a good start, we should ensure that the cause comes to fruition. Footnote 1. Book of Songs. Shi Jing. End of footnote 1. The rejuvenation of the Chinese nation requires the dedicated efforts of one generation after another. Having created a splendid civilization of over 5,000 years, the Chinese nation will certainly usher in an even brighter future. Going forward, under the leadership of the CPC, all the people of China should take Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of three represents, and the scientific outlook on development as our guide to action. We should follow the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics, pursue the four-pronged strategy, promote patriotism and the great spirit of resisting aggression, and forge ahead as one to reach our goals. Let us bear in mind the great truth of history. Justice will prevail. Peace will prevail. The people will prevail. Improve our ability to participate in global governance. September 27, 2016. Main points of the speech at the 35th Group Study Session of the Political Bureau of the 18th CPC Central Committee. With the increase in global challenges and constant changes in the international balance of power, there is a growing demand for strengthening global governance and transforming the global governance system. We must seize the opportunity and take appropriate actions to foster an international order that is fairer, more equitable, and more rational, and to ensure that the common interests of our country and other developing countries are more securely assured, the, that external conditions are more favorable for the realization of the two centenary goals and the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation, and that we make a greater contribution to the noble cause of peace and development of mankind. Since the 18th CPC National Congress, we have worked proactively to uphold the international order that is based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and safeguard the fruits of victory in World War II that the Chinese people won at the expense of great national sacrifice. We have put forward the Belt and Road Initiative, launched new multilateral financial institutions such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and facilitated the reform of the IMF quota and governance mechanism. We have also participated actively in creating governance rules in many emerging fields, including the oceans, the polar regions, the internet, outer space, nuclear security, action against corruption, and climate change, and promoted reform of the unfair and unreasonable aspects of the current global governance system. The recent G20 Hangzhou Summit was the highest level international summit hosted by China in recent years, unmatched in scale and influence, leveraging the opportunity to set the agenda, we introduced new initiatives and guided the summit to produce a series of pioneering, pace setting and institutional outcomes. We showcased our unique characteristics and extended our influence. As a result, the summit fulfilled the goal of charting the course for the world economy, providing momentum for global economic growth, and building a solid foundation for international cooperation. The summit provided us with an opportunity for the first time to comprehensively explain our philosophy on global economic governance, taking innovation as the core, giving prominence to development issues in global macroeconomic policy coordination, building a framework of global multilateral investment rules, releasing a president's statement on climate change, and introducing green finance to the G20 agenda. 
All of this has left a deep imprint of China in the history of the G20. The pattern of global governance depends on the international balance of power and the transformation of the global governance system originates from changes in the balance of power. We should take economic development as the central task, pool our efforts to manage our own affairs well, and improve our capability in dealing with international issues. We should actively participate in global governance and shoulder international responsibilities. We must do all we can within the limitations of our capabilities. The existing global governance system has found it increasingly difficult to meet the requirements of the times, and the international community is calling for reform. This is a common cause of all countries and regions, so we must pursue the transformation of the global governance system by following the principles of extensive consultation, joint development, and shared benefits. We must endeavor to reach consensus on the transformation proposals and turn it into concerted actions. We must continue to voice opinions on behalf of developing countries and strengthen solidarity and cooperation with other developing countries. We should start from what we are able to do and what is agreed upon. At this stage, we should expand the results of the Hangzhou Summit, reinforce and give full play to the role of the G20 as the main platform for global economic governance and promote the transformation of the G20 into a long-term governance mechanism. We must continue to promote the Belt and Road Initiative and urge all related parties to strengthen planning and strategic coordination. We should further cooperation within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, strengthen mechanisms in the Conference on Interaction and Conference Building Measures in Asia, CICA, the East Asia Summit, and the ASEAN Regional Forum and integrate regional free trade negotiation frameworks. We should also take a more active part in rulemaking in emerging fields such as the Internet, the polar regions, the deep sea, and outer space, and give more support to programs and cooperation mechanisms related to educational exchange, dialogue between civilizations, and ecology. Since the 18th National CPC Congress, we have advocated the principle of upholding the greater good and pursuing shared interests and facilitated the building of a new model of international relations featuring cooperation and mutual benefit, a community of shared future for mankind and a partnership network that links all parts of the world. We have also advocated a common, comprehensive, and sustainable security concept based on cooperation. These ideas have been well received in the international community. We should continue to explain to the international community our concept about reform of the global governance system. We will seek cooperation and mutually beneficial results rather than confrontation or zero-sum games. In order to facilitate the transformation of the global governance system, we will try to identify the greatest common denominators, expand cooperation, promote consensus among all parties, and strengthen coordination and cooperation. We must improve our ability to participate in global governance and, in particular, our ability to make rules, set agendas, and carry out publicity and coordination. To play an effective role in global governance, we need a large number of professionals who have a good knowledge of the policies and guiding principles of the party, the government, and the national conditions, have a global outlook, have a good command of foreign languages, have a good understanding of international rules, and are skilled in international negotiations. We should strengthen the training of high-caliber personnel involved in global governance, ensure that we have adequate trained professionals, and build a talent pool, providing personnel support for our participation in global governance. peaceful development and cooperation with other countries. 
Asia-Pacific Partnership of Mutual Trust, Inclusiveness, Cooperation, and Win-Win Progress. November 11th, 2014. Part of the opening speech at the 22nd APEC Economic Leaders Meeting. We are all APEC members. It meets the common interests of us all to foster an open economy in the Asia-Pacific featuring innovative development, interconnected growth, and converging interests. To achieve this goal, all the economies in the region need to work together to build an Asia-Pacific partnership of mutual trust, inclusiveness, cooperation, and win-win progress. And this will inject new energy into the economic development of both the Asia-Pacific and the wider world. First, we should join together in charting the course for future development of the Asia-Pacific. It is vital to the interests of every APEC member. Having reached consensus on launching the process of the Free Trade Area of the Asia-Pacific, FTAAP, promoting connectivity, and pursuing innovative growth, we should now translate that consensus into action. We should draw up the development blueprint for the next 5, 10, or even 25 years and implement it step by step. Second, we should meet global challenges as one. In the post-financial crisis period, we need to focus on the core task of sustaining growth and enhance macro policy coordination. We should also effectively address global issues such as epidemics, food security, and energy security. We should know each other better through the sharing of information, share best practices through exchange of experience, facilitate collective actions through consultation and coordination, and boost regional cooperation through mutual assistance. Third, we should work together to build cooperation platforms. Partnership means pitching in together on common goals and major initiatives. We should build APEC into an institutional platform for promoting integration, a policy platform based on experience sharing, an open platform against trade protectionism, a development platform to intensify economic and technical cooperation, and a communication platform for boosting connectivity. A stronger and more dynamic APEC is possible only with support from all its members. I wish to announce here that China will donate 110 million U.S. dollars to support APEC in building its institution and capability and in conducting practical cooperation in various fields. Fourth, we should all pursue interconnected development. Partnership also means win-win cooperation and mutual learning. Some developing economies in the Asia-Pacific are now facing difficulties. If they cannot achieve individual development, wider development of the whole Asia-Pacific will not be sustainable. We need to increase financial and technical support to developing members, give full reign to the diversity among the Asia-Pacific economies, draw on each other's strengths, better leverage the amplifying effects of interconnected actions, and achieve common development. Over the next three years, the Chinese government will provide 1,500 training opportunities to APEC developing members in support of capacity building projects in trade, investment, and other fields. Towards a China-EU partnership for peace, growth, reform, and civilization. May 6, 2015. Main points of a congratulatory message to EU leaders on the 40th anniversary of the establishment of China-EU diplomatic relations. Thanks to our joint efforts, the China-EU relationship has made remarkable progress since diplomatic relations were established 40 years ago. The two sides have maintained a consensus in promoting world peace and common development, with constant progress in terms of the depth and breadth of cooperation. 
as China and the EU grow in strategic significance, theirs is becoming one of the most important bilateral global relationships. A China-EU partnership for peace, growth, reform, and civilization is in the interests of all EU citizens and the Chinese people and will contribute to the peace and development of humankind. China attaches great importance to bilateral relations, and on the occasion of its 40th anniversary, we would like to promote the partnership in these four respects to achieve a comprehensive strategic partnership for mutual benefit with EU leaders. A New Era of China-Africa Cooperation and Common Development December 4, 2015, part of the speech at the opening ceremony of the Johannesburg Summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. The world is undergoing profound changes. Economic globalization and information technology have helped greatly release social productivity. We have been presented with unprecedented opportunities for development. On the other hand, we are faced with unprecedented challenges as hegemony, terrorism, financial turbulence, and environmental crises have become more pronounced. In conducting China's relations with Africa, we apply the principles of sincerity, affinity, and good faith, and uphold the values of the greater good and shared interests. We will work with our African friends to embrace a new era of mutually beneficial cooperation and common development. With this in mind, I propose that the new China-Africa Strategic Partnership be upgraded to a comprehensive strategic and cooperative partnership. To forge this partnership, we should strengthen the following five major pillars. First, we should remain committed to political equality and mutual trust. A high degree of mutual trust is the foundation of the China-Africa friendship. We should respect each other's choice of development path, and neither of us should try to impose our will on the other. On issues involving the core interests and major concerns of either side, we should jointly uphold equity and justice in the spirit of mutual understanding and mutual support. China strongly believes that Africa belongs to the African people and that African affairs should be decided by the African people. Second, we should remain committed to mutually beneficial economic cooperation. We Chinese value friendship and justice, as well as shared interests, and we place more importance on the former. Friendship and justice, which define China-Africa relations, require us to facilitate Africa's development efforts and ultimately deliver common development through mutually beneficial cooperation. We should fully leverage the strengths of mutual political trust and economic complementarity between China and Africa, and focus on cooperation in industrial capacity, networks of high-speed railway, expressway, and regional civil aviation and industrialization. This will enable China-Africa cooperation to develop in all areas and benefit both Chinese and African people. Third, we should remain committed to mutually enriching cultural exchanges. Diversity makes the world beautiful. We are proud that both China and Africa have time-honored and splendid civilizations. We should strengthen cultural exchanges and mutual learning between China and Africa and facilitate exchanges between young people, women, think tanks, the media, universities, and other sectors of the two sides. We should promote cultural interaction, policy coordination, and people-to-people -people exchanges to advance common progress and ensure lasting friendship between China and Africa from generation to generation. Fourth, we should remain committed to mutual assistance in security. Poverty is the root cause of chaos, while peace is the guarantor of development. 
Development holds the key to solving all problems. China supports African people in settling African issues themselves in the African way. We are of the view that in, that in resolving security issues, both symptoms and root causes must be addressed in a holistic way. China stands ready to help Africa build the capacity to maintain and strengthen peace and security and support Africa in its endeavors to speed up development, eradicate poverty, and realize durable peace. Fifth, we should remain committed to solidarity and coordination in international affairs. China and Africa share a common position on and interests in a wide range of international issues. We should strengthen consultation and coordination, work for a fairer and more equitable global governance system, and safeguard our common interests. China will continue to stand up and speak for Africa at the United Nations and other forums and support Africa in playing a greater role on the world stage. To build a China-Africa comprehensive strategic and cooperative partnership, China will implement 10 cooperation programs with Africa in the next three years, guided by the principles of government leadership, enterprise as the major actor, market operation, and mutually beneficial cooperation, China will introduce these programs to address three bottleneck issues holding back Africa's development, namely inadequate infrastructure, lack of professional and skilled personnel, and shortage of capital. These programs will help accelerate Africa's industrialization and agricultural modernization and thereby help Africa to achieve sustainable development on its own. The China-Africa Industrialization Program China will actively promote partnering in the fields of industrial complementarity and industrial capacity between China and Africa and encourage more Chinese enterprises to make investment in Africa. China will build or upgrade a number of industrial parks in cooperation with Africa send senior experts and advisors to Africa, and set up regional vocational education centers and schools with a view to enhancing Africa's industrial capacity. In this context, China will also train 200,000 technical personnel and provide 40,000 training opportunities for African personnel in China. The China-Africa Agricultural Modernization Program China will share its experience in agricultural development with Africa and transfer readily applicable farming technologies. We will encourage Chinese enterprises to engage in large-scale farming, animal husbandry, and grain storage and processing in Africa to create more local jobs and increase rural incomes. China will carry out agricultural development projects in 100 African villages to raise rural living standards, send 30 teams of agricultural experts to Africa, and establish a 10 plus 10 cooperation mechanism between Chinese and African agricultural research institutes. China is gravely concerned about the poor harvests caused by El Nino in many African countries and will provide renminbi 1, mil, 1 billion of emergency food aid to the affected countries. The China-Africa Infrastructure Program China will step up mutually beneficial cooperation with Africa in infrastructure planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance. We support Chinese enterprises in their active participation in Africa's infrastructural development, particularly in sectors such as railways, roads, regional aviation, ports, electricity, and telecommunications, which will help enhance Africa's capacity for sustainable development. We will help African countries in establishing five transport universities. The China-Africa Financial Program 
China will expand its renminbi settlement and currency swap operations with African countries. It will encourage Chinese financial institutions to set up more branches in Africa and increase its investment and financing cooperation with Africa in multiple ways so as to provide financial support and services for Africa's industrialization and modernization. The China-Africa Green Development Program China will support Africa in bolstering its capacity for green, low-carbon, and sustainable development and help Africa in launching 100 projects to develop clean energy, protect wildlife, promote environment-friendly agricultural projects, and build smart cities. China-Africa cooperation will never be pursued at the expense of Africa's ecosystem and long-term interests. The China-Africa Trade and Investment Facilitation Program. China will carry out 50 aid-for-trade projects to improve Africa's software and hardware capacity for its internal and external trade and investment. China is ready to negotiate comprehensive free trade agreements with countries and regional organizations in Africa covering trade in goods and services and investment cooperation. These agreements, once concluded, will boost China's import of African products. China will support African countries in enhancing law enforcement capacity in areas such as customs, quality inspection, and taxation. We will also engage in cooperation with Africa in standardization, certification, and accreditation, and e-commerce. The China-Africa Poverty Reduction Program While intensifying its own poverty reduction efforts, China will increase its aid to Africa. We will carry out 200 Happy Life projects and poverty reduction programs focusing on women and children. We will count cancel outstanding debts in the form of interest-free government loans borrowed by the least developed African countries that would mature by the end of 2015. The China-Africa Public Health Program. China will help Africa strengthen its public health prevention and control system and build up its capacity in public health, including the building of the African Center for Disease Control. We will support pace-setting cooperation between 20 Chinese hospitals and 20 African hospitals and upgrade hospital departments. We will continue to send medical teams to Africa and provide medical assistance, such as the Brightness Action Program, for cataract patients and maternal and child care. We will provide more of the anti-malaria compound artemisinin to Africa, and encourage and support local drug production by Chinese enterprises in Africa to increase Africans' access to medicines. The China-Africa Cultural and People-to-People Program China will build five cultural centers in Africa and provide satellite TV reception to 10,000 African villages. We will provide Africa with 2,000 educational opportunities with diplomas or degrees and 30,000 government scholarships. Every year, we will sponsor visits by 200 African scholars and study trips by 500 young Africans to China and train 1,000 media professionals from Africa. We will support the opening of more direct flights between China and Africa to boost our tourism cooperation. The China-Africa Peace and Security Program. China will provide a grant of U.S. $60 million to African Union to support the building and operation of the African Standby Force and the African Capacity for the Immediate Response to Crisis. China will continue to participate in U.N. peacekeeping missions in Africa and support African countries in their capacity, building in areas such as national defense, counterterrorism, riot prevention, customs, and immigration control. To ensure successful implementation of these 10 cooperation programs, 
China has decided to provide financial support totaling U.S. $60 billion. This includes U.S. $5 billion of grants and interest-free loans, U.S. $35 billion of concessionary loans on more favorable terms and export credit lines, an increase of U.S. $5 billion to the China Africa Development Fund and the Special Loan for the Development of African SMEs, respectively and the China-Africa Fund for industrial cooperation with an initial contribution of U.S. $10 billion. This year marks the 15th anniversary of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC. The past 15 years have seen fruitful progress across the board in China-Africa practical cooperation. In 2014, two-way trade and China's total non-financial investment in Africa had grown by multiples of 22 and 60 compared with the year 2000, which shows that China's contribution to Africa's economic development has risen significantly. FOCAC has become a pace setter in China-Africa cooperation, a model of South-South cooperation, and a champion for greater international attention to and input in Africa. China-Africa relations have today reached a stage of growth unmatched in history. We should take bold steps, scale the heights, and look afar. Let us join hands, pool the wisdom and strength of the 2.4 billion Chinese and Africans, and open a new era of China-Africa mutually beneficial cooperation and common development.